Dr. Lester Sumrall ministers daily by television to millions of people around the world. For the next hour, you'll experience one of the most exciting programs that is proclaiming the truth of God's Word, love, and blessing. You are to experience the life story of Lester Sumrall, a man of faith and destiny. And now, Dr. Sumrall. I hope you have uh, seen part one of Lester Summerall, a man of faith and a man of destiny. I have been very conscious of destiny uh, since I was a small child. Uh, I had a very serious disease as a very small child and uh, the doctors thought I would die and, and God healed me of it. They call it pellagra. And God healed me of it uh, by the prayers of my mother and that group of women that went around with her called the prayer meeting group. And uh, that was one of the earliest things I can remember uh, is of that, of that healing uh, that came to me. And also at one time I was on a train track, a railroad track, and they were shunting. And a boxcar was coming that had no engine behind it. And I was in the road of that boxcar. My older brother saw it and he ran like the wind. He didn't have time to yell or anything. He hit me like a football a uh, man, a uh, player that is attacking and knocked me uh, from that train track and we both went into a ditch and he saved my life. So I have been quite conscious uh, of destiny. When I went out to preach, I had men that took their knives to fight me with their knives. And uh, I had a man to come out with his gun to shoot me uh, one night and showed his gun that he would kill me. Uh, and so I have been quite conscious that I, I am a person of destiny, that God made it that way. And also, uh, whether I uh, desire it or not, I will always uh, be marked as a person of faith. For the simple reason I have trusted God so implicitly for very unusual things until I, I became marked as a man of faith. Also, I preach faith very strong that God says what He means God means what He says, and you better believe it, and that'll mark you as a person of faith. In our first uh, 60 minutes in part one, we told you about the, the, the first vision uh, when, when I saw a casket on one side of me, and I saw a Bible on one side of me, and God said, I would choose one of those, and I chose the Bible. And that's the way I became a minister of the gospel. Uh, not the nicest of circumstances, you see, but that's just the way it happened. And I was a, a person that no one, no one expected me to be a minister, my family, nor the neighbors, or anyone that knew me, because I wasn't exactly a model, you know. And, and so uh, they thought I might be hanged by the time I was 21 or something like that, but they didn't think I would ever be a minister. And so for me to keep my promise to God and go out preaching uh, was a surprise to, to everybody except my little mother. <laughs> Mothers are always wonderful. I began preaching by leaving Panama City, going north on the little road uh, toward Alabama, up above us, and in little country schoolhouses, uh, we would talk to the one that was in charge of the school to loan us the school. And, and most of the time they had no electric and so they, we had to also borrow lanterns. And so we had, we had church. Those parts of the country very seldom ever had anybody. And so to have anything was a place where boys and girls could get together, farmers could get together and talk about their crops. And, and so it became a, a social thing. I would want you to think my, my preaching was so dramatic that it was causing the people to come out. Sometimes we would have several hundred people especially when we had open air uh, revivals under, under arbors, you know, made of branches of trees. And, and, but it, it went on for 18 months. Now, in, inside of me, uh, I didn't like this. And I was rude and, and none loving. I mean, I, I had no compassion for anybody. So what God did was by His mercy and grace, it were, I, I wasn't really identified with it very much. God was doing it. In Tennessee, after... Uh, 18 months of preaching. I was getting close to 19 years of age now and felt like a veteran 
I'd gone through all kinds of problems, all kinds of sorrows, all kinds of accidents close to death. And so I, I, I wasn't a newcomer anymore. I'd preach almost the same sermons everywhere I went. And so they were getting to be better, you know, as I, as I was relating them. Also, I had some experience, I could say. And under that brush arbor, this is what happened. And in that country school house, this is what happened. And so I was getting to be, you know, quite a person. And one night in a little building in Tennessee, my life was changed by the power of God. It is so wonderful when God changes a person's life. God does it. You don't do it. I was sitting on the side, the audience was sitting here, and the young man that was leading the song service was getting pretty good. In fact, and this is the place where he married. He was a little older than I, he might have been 21 by now. Uh, but we, we, we were there for a 10 days meeting, he married one of the girls, and I, I lost him in this meeting. And, and that's where I made my consecration to God, is in that meeting. But I was sitting there on the side, looking at him, looking at the people. There wouldn't be over 60 people present, if that many. And he was leading them away, and they were joyful. You know, country meetings are joyful. And I was sitting there, and suddenly, with my eyes wide open, I didn't see him. I didn't see the people. I saw the world. Now, when you're seeing a vision, it is so natural that you don't know it's a vision. You, you find it out when you come back to yourself. It is so real until it is more real than life itself. I saw the Japanese in their colorful garments that they love to wear, kimonos. I saw the Mongolians, rough, tough, ragged. Who? <laughs> it scare you almost. And then I saw the Chinese, all sorts of Chinese. Some of them so elegantly dressed. Two and three uh, little things coming out here showing you they didn't have on one undergarment. They had on three or four undergarments of beautiful silks. And so they were darlings. And then I saw the South Sea Islanders, naked, rough, mean. <laughs> I saw them from South America and from African Indian, from Europe. I saw the world. It was exciting. Millions and millions of people. They were on a highway and they were going they, they weren't walking. They were in a little oriental trot. And I, I was watching them, you know. It was as real as my flesh is right there. I saw them. And God, you know, a vision is a tremendous thing. God picked me up out of my body. I saw my body stay there in church. And I, that's the summer all, left my body. And the way I went over the top of these people, we, I could look down and there they were pretty. Oh, oh it was a... <laughs> It was a talk about a moving picture show. Hey, that was a beautiful one. And went right over the top of them to the end of the road they were on. God said, that's the road of life. Yeah. At the end of the road was eternity. And I saw the world go to hell. There were the flames. It was like a volcano in action. And it would come up and engulf God only knows like, like 100,000 go whoop, and they'd go down into it, screaming, crying, yelling, tearing their hair, scratching their face. There they went. And, and I, I, I uh, you know, I'd lost my breath. I said, oh, God, God, you have to see a scene like that to preach like I preach every day of your life with all your heart to the whole world. No wonder I preached in a hundred nations of the world. You couldn't slow me down. I've gone by ox cart, I've gone by wagon, I've gone by riding donkeys, I've gone by camels, I've gone by every conceivable means of transportation to preach the gospel to the whole world. That vision caused that. I'd never been in a, what you call a missionary meeting in my life. I'd never seen missionaries dressed up in costumes of their countries in my life. I hadn't seen any such thing. This was a new thing. And I was looking at it. But the end of the road was hell. Who? You know, when they got to the end of that road, to the precipice, they, they, would, they would try to back up. They'd say, <laughs> and the, the pressure from behind would, poof, and over they'd go into hell. The pressure from behind would catapult them, whip, and the way they'd go into the air, screaming and crying and yelling. They didn't bother about eternity until they got there. Isn't that amazing? I, I looked at it. I observed it. I don't know how long weeping. And God spoke to me and said, you are to blame for it. Oh, I says, not me. 
I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I've lived in Mobile, Alabama, and, I, and, I, and I've lived in Panama City, Florida, and I have never been abroad. Therefore, I am not to blame. And God quoted the Bible for me, and I'd read it and didn't see it. And you know, you can do the same. Read the Bible and not see it. And he said, if the ungodly commits his ungodly deeds, and he dies in his ungodliness, and you don't warn him of his ungodliness, I will, I will, I will cause his blood to be upon your hands. And I suddenly saw blood running through all my fingers. The blood of the nations. You know, God can make a missionary when he wants to. And that's the reason I'm looking at you, speaking to millions of people for the simple reason God put it there. I didn't put it there. My father was a machinist. I'm supposed to work with machinery, but I didn't. God made me work with you. And he did it. I didn't do it. He did it. And I saw the blood. And I said, God, what can I do? He said, what the word says. Tell them. Reprove them. Rebuke them. The nations. I said, the nations? The nations. You saw them. Go to hell. And my word says, if the ungodly dies in his ungodliness, and you don't warn him of his ungodliness, I will demand his blood at your hands. Ooh. I said, God, why don't you tell everybody, not just me? He says, I have. It's in my book. It's in the third chapter of Ezekiel. I didn't know it was in the book. And he says, you're going to be judged by the book. And he said, when you go down to the courts and you tell the judge, oh, I didn't know I was wrong. He pays no attention to that. He says, you better know the laws of the land. And says, you better know the laws of eternity. Oh, neighbor, if you don't read the Bible, you're in trouble. If you don't know your responsibilities to God, you're in trouble. <laughs> God said it was in the book. And I said, yeah, Lord, what shall I do? And at that moment, I woke. Now, I couldn't tell you whether I was there an hour or an hour and a half or two hours. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, country people are very strange folks. You know what they did? I never had enough courage to ask them if they tried to shake me. I never did. I, I never talked to anybody about that meeting. I was ashamed of that meeting. You know, after all, I was 19 years old. I was ashamed of it. I don't know whether they thought I went to sleep and they did it as a joke or what. All those people went home and they took the lantern with them. And when I came back to my natural self, I was in a dark black little school building by myself. And I said, I'm back in Tennessee. I have seen the whole world. Gorgeous. Beautiful. Talk about Technicolor. I saw the first. Gorgeous. And then I said, but hell. Whew. I said, Lester, hell's real. You better stay out of there. Hell's real. You saw it. Don't say you don't know anything about it. You saw it. And you saw the people that are going to hell. You saw it. And he said, their blood is on your hands. Unless you warn them of their evilness. I said, God, I fell on the floor. Now, you know, little country schoolhouses are not very clean. They bring in mud, and oftentimes they don't wash it off. They just sweep off the top. I went down on that floor. Now, in those days, I was a very elegant young man. I would preach in a white tie, a white shirt, white trousers, white tie, white socks, and white shoes. I was the white young preacher from Florida. <laughs> I laid down on that floor. I'd never had a burden so big in my life. I began to weep and to cry, asking forgiveness of my sins, asking forgiveness of the way I had treated people, Asking forgiveness when I hadn't given an altar call in my services when I should have. Asking forgiveness because I hadn't gotten down many times and prayed with people seeking. So I, I cleansed my spirit and my soul. And then I began to pray, God, all those people from Japan. Oh, God, all those people from China. Oh, God, all those people from India. Lord, that was the first time in my life I'd ever prayed for the nations of the world. I began to hurt. 
I hurt all over. I began to sweat. And that sweat began to mingle with that mud all night long until eight o'clock the next morning. I cried. I prayed. I had travail. Maybe you don't know what the word means. Jesus travailed in the Garden of Eden and in the Garden of Gethsemane. He travailed so deeply that blood pressed itself through the, the, the skin and ran down his face, bursted the blood vessels and came out. He knew what travail. I've only had that three or four times in my whole life. I had travail until I almost died. I felt as if I might die that night. The next morning at eight o'clock, the light was coming through the windows, the shutters of the little school building. I got up. I'd never seen a mess. My white was now red, streaked and gobbed. I had mud in my hair. I had mud on my face. I had perspired. I had prayed on my knees and I'd prayed on my back and I'd prayed on my stomach. I'd prayed every way possible. But when the light came, I looked like a hog that had been in a pig pen. It was awful. It was awful. And I said, I have to slip away and get clean and let nobody ever see it. And nobody did see it. God made it possible. I slipped over to the place where I was staying and slipped in and got those things off and bathed and came out. And it was real interesting. People looked at me and said, uh, you stayed in church all night. I said, yes says, uh, something happened to you, didn't it? I said, yes. Did you know it was several years before I ever told the story? I was afraid to tell it. And all those people went to hell. I was, I was afraid to tell it. It was several years before I ever told it. They wanted to know what happened. And I said, uh, God and I talked together. That was all I'd tell them. I was afraid to tell them. But at that moment, I began to prepare myself for a world ministry. Imagine. <laughs> out of the country, out of the hills, out of the little villages, out of the little country school houses, here was a man that said he would have a world ministry. He would cleanse his hands of the blood of multitudes around the world. You want to know the biggest miracle you'll ever know? I'll tell it to you. The night that happened to me outside of Dyersburg, Tennessee, in the country, in London, England, 4,000 miles away, a man named Howard Carter was praying, and God spoke to him. He was a prophet and said, I have a companion prepared for you. He wrote it down. He was at that time past 40 years old and had never been married. He shall come from afar. That meant it wouldn't be a woman. He wouldn't be getting married. He would be a total stranger when he comes. Three he's. And this is what he will say. And he wrote down all the words this person would say. He read it to his staff of teachers. He was the president of the Bible college. He read it to his student body and said, this is a prophecy. He says, if I'm a false prophet, mark me as one and discard me. But if this comes true, you'll know that I am a prophet of God. They said, yes, we will. He says, is it a woman? He read it back to them and said, it says he. It cannot be a woman. Did you know that 18 months after that, he came to America? I didn't, I'd never heard of him. He had never heard of me. By this time, I was preaching out in Oklahoma. And God told me, he says, go to Eureka Springs where they're having a camp meeting. It was Wednesday, and I was supposed to preach all that week. But the camp meeting closed on Sunday, and so did my meeting. God says, no, go today. I had a crisis. I had to go to the pastor and said, I am quitting the meeting as of last night. And he got angry. He said, you're a poor little preacher. See, I wasn't, I wasn't 20 yet. <laughs> Just about it. And I, I said, God's told me, God, you're supposed to keep your word. Nevertheless, God. And I said, now, listen, I'm sorry. And I said, this never happened before. I'd finally gotten into a church to preach. Now, we weren't in, in the church. We were in a brush arbor outside the church. It was a big meeting, three and four hundred people. Uh, that is for those days. It was in the oil country back, back there in Oklahoma. Rough people. Ooh, you better believe it. I got in trouble there. And, uh, and so I said, I've got to go. God told me to go. So you can preach tonight and dismiss the meeting. He said, I'm going to tell all the pastors never to have you. 
that, that you, you're not to be trusted, that you will quit in the middle of the week. And he says, furthermore, I'm not going to give you any money. And I said, I don't want any money. I didn't ask you for any money. I only told you that God told me to go to Eureka Springs, Arkansas, to a camp meeting, and I have to go. And, and oh, he says, that's not God, and you're wrong. And I said, well, now, that's all right, sir. Just, just God bless you. <laughs> I've never seen him again since. And so I, I, I drove out over 100, 150 miles or something to Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Got over there, and they had an Englishman speaking in the teaching services in the morning, Howard Carter, president of a Bible college in London. Well, I didn't know anything about him, about his school, never heard anything. And so I sat and listened, and when he was through, he walked out onto the sidewalk. And I walked up, shook his hand, said, thank you for the Word of God that you taught us. And I began to say the funniest things you've ever heard. I said, and you know, I'll go with you wherever you go. I will go with you across the widest oceans. I will go with you up the highest mountains. I didn't know we were going to Tibet together. I, I said, I, I, said I, will, I will sucker you. I will assist you. I will strengthen you. And, and I, I, will, I will help you. And in every time of need, I shall be with you. I said, no, I won't either. And he just stood there. He was a very polite person. He stood there, was shaking his head like this. And I started to leave, and that thing started again inside of me. It didn't come from my head. It came from my spirit. And it said, and, and, and when you're old, I will strengthen you and assist you and help you. And I shall succor you in your, in your, in your old age. And you shall be unto me as a father. And I, I, I just, and I said, sir, uh, uh, excuse me. I said, I've never done this before. And if you'll just excuse me, I'll be going. And he said, no. You come with me to my room. The hotel was about a half a block away where they kept their guests. So I went to the hotel. We went up to his floor. He opened a little blank book. And a man named Stanley Frodsham was there, editor of a large magazine in this country. And they got in the corner and said, whoo, 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 whoo. I said, they weren't letting me in on it. And, and, and Howard Carter was saying this and that and the other. And so they both came in on me and said, it seems that God has done something very unusual today. And I said, uh, oh? <laughs> All I'd known was that uh, I'd talk funny. And he said, uh, what are you? I said, I'm an evangelist. He said, do you have any intention of being a, a missionary? I said, a missionary? I'm on my way around the world right now. He says, you are. He says, how long ago have you had that? I said, for 18 months when I had a vision of the world going to hell. They looked at one another. And they could have fainted. He said, did you know God gave me a prophecy 18 months ago, same time he'd given me my vision. And he said, uh, I have a com traveling companion for you. He says, you're the one. Come from afar. You're 4,000 miles from London. This is what you will say. Look what you said on the sidewalk. That's what the prophecy said. You gave the word of God exactly as God gave it to me in London. Who? I didn't know there were nine gifts of the Spirit. I had guessed 44. I never, heard a, I never heard a sermon in my life on the gifts of the Spirit. And he said, this is one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. This is the first of the gifts. This is the gift of the Word of God's wisdom. It was <laughs> like a man from outer space talking. He says, are you willing to travel with me? I said, I'm willing to travel with anybody. I'm ready to go. He says, fine. Shook hands. I says, I'll see you later. I walked out the door, got in my car. My parents now lived in Mobile, Alabama again. And I started toward home from Eureka Springs. I forgot to get his address, where he was going. I couldn't. He was on his spinning one day in a place on his way to the West Coast and around the world. I didn't give him my address, so I lost him. The same hour, I found him. But I went on home. I sold my car. That gave me enough money for my first ticket. I got on a train in Mobile, the Sunset Limited. Started toward Los Angeles, California. Three or four days and nights. Man, the first time I crossed Texas, I thought Texas covered the whole world. You awoke in Texas and you went to bed in Texas and you woke in Texas and you went to bed in Texas and said, oh God, when is Texas ever going to cease? Uh, that's when you're on a, on a train that stops at every little town going through Texas. Uh, it's, it, it's interesting. I arrived in Los Angeles and, and went to Dr. Turnbull's church there, Bethel Temple. And I said, Dr. Turnbull, I'm an evangelist, Lester Summerall. He says, yeah, Howard Carter spoke about you. I said, where is Howard Carter? Well, he says, I think he's in Japan. I said, can I preach for you? Oh, he says, yes. He told me that you would preach for me. 
<laughs> he was backing away from me. And he had only met me for 15 minutes, uh, half an hour totally. And, and so uh, I said, thank you. And, and then I went out to Manhattan Beach to preach. And, and there a man named Arthur Frotcham, the brother of Stanley Frotcham. He, he was pastor. And, and he opened his door for me to preach. And so I said, uh, Mr. Frotcham, uh, you know Howard Carter? Yes, very bosom-like. We're both Englishmen from London. Oh, yeah. And he said, I said, where is it? He? he says, in China. Well, I said, now, Japan has 100 million, China 500 million. Yeah, I guess I can find him. That's only 600 million. Had to find him in. Dr. Lillian Yeomans was still teaching at LIFE Bible College. And so she heard of me going with Howard Carter. She was a very close friend of Howard Carter. She said, come over for dinner. And Lydia Yeomans was, Yeomans was one of those, uh, she was an MD, medical doctor, and uh, one of those very remarkable person. Uh, before we had dinner, she had a little prayer, a little prayer carpet about this week. She says, kneel on that carpet. God's Holy Ghost is in it. Now, you know, I was from the hills of uh, <laughs> Arkansas and, and the plains of Oklahoma and, and the tall timber of, of Mississippi and Alabama and Florida. I was pretty down to earth. Not no magic carpets, you know. But I obeyed. After all, she was 85. And so I, I knelt down and she began to pray for me. Oh, that, that doctor had God's power. If, if you've ever read in her writings, they are tremendous. When we got through and had dinner, I said, you know, Howard Carter, where is he? She says, in India. I says, dear God Almighty, there's another 500 million. I said, I'm not sure now I can even find him. And something inside says, why don't you pray about it? You know, <laughs> if we would pray, rather than talk, We'd get along so much better. So I prayed. I said, Lord, how am I going to find this man? And, and uh, the Lord spoke back and said, uh, get to the bottom and work up. You know, the Lord has the most unusual ways of telling you what to do. He didn't tell me where he was at all. He said, go to the bottom. I said, what's the bottom? He said, Australia. Fine. I don't know where he is. Nobody said he was there. They all said he was in India and, and China and, and Japan. And so I went and got me a ticket. And I started for Australia. And what a trip we had. Oh, if I were to tell you all the things that happened on that first trip, <laughs> you, you'd, never, you'd never forget it. Uh, an infidel tore me to shreds on that trip. And, and some church people made all kind of fun at me of being a faith preacher. On, on, uh, I, I, the devil gave it to me for 30 days. And finally, we, we arrived in New Zealand. And in New Zealand, we, the boat stopped in Wellington. I'd been on that thing for over four weeks, and I was so sick and tired of a boat. It was my first long ride in my life, and I wanted to get off that boat. So I, I got off. And let me tell you this story backwards. Howard Carter was in New Zealand. Now, I did not know it. He was at a minister's retreat, 40, 50, 60 ministers. They were high up in the mountains where there were no telephones or nothing else, and he was teaching this minister's retreat. He went in to pray in the afternoon, and as he was kneeling by his bed praying, he said, God, you gave me a, 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 a traveling companion uh, to, to go with me, and I lost him. Where is he? The Spirit of God spoke to him and said, that traveling companion is not lost. He is in Wellington, right close by here. In the city. He is on a boat in the harbor. The boat will dock, and the next morning he will get off the boat and spend several hours looking for churches in Wellington. Send the Wellington pastor home and tell him, uh, that you will meet him in Australia in three months. He comes walking out of his prayer room, and here's all these preachers. Uh, he said, which one of you are from Wellington? A great big old New Zealander said, me. He said, would you go home? He didn't want to. He was up there to this retreat. He said, I, I have a, a young American friend that's arriving and will be at your house tomorrow morning. Give him this card. On the back of the card, it said, go on to Australia. I'll meet you there in three months in Sydney. That's all it said. They said, we don't have any telephones up here. H how did you know he's in Wellington? Oh, he says, the Holy Spirit told me. You see, that's the gift of the Word of God's knowledge. God giving you supernaturally knowledge of something that you couldn't see with your eyes, couldn't hear with the ears, but God told you about it. You see, that's the gifts of the Spirit functioning. And so uh, th these New Zealanders were so stirred up, they said, well, go on, see if he's a liar or not. See what kind of teacher we got. Come back and tell us. So he got in his car and he sped down to his home in Wellington and, and, and he and his wife almost had a fit uh, waiting for somebody to come that was an American. I got off that boat and uh, I didn't know what other church to look for except the Assembly of God. And so I, I walked over to a big church and it was a Church of England. I said, have you ever heard of the Assemblies of God? They said, no. 
I met a man on the street and I said, have you ever heard of a church called the Seminars of God? He laughed and said, Sinners of God. He said, that's a great name. That's a great name. I could join that. I said, I didn't say sinners of God. I said, assemblies of, no, he said, I've never heard of anything like that. I went to the Salvation Army and I went to the Presbyterian and I went to the Baptist. And I wore myself out from eight till 11 and nobody had ever heard of it. And I was leaning over by a light post there in downtown Wellington. And I said, now, Lord, I'm sure there's a church here. I've heard of Smith Wigglesworth being here and I've heard of revivals. I, I know there's a church here. I wish I could find it. And a man came walking down the street and Lord put something in my heart. He walked up and said, say, come here. I said, have you ever heard of a church that when they meet together, sometimes all together they say, hallelujah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Over across the railroad tracks there, you, you, you go out that way out of town and you go up to the left on a little hill and you'll find it there. Well, I says, evidently God knows how to find it when I don't. So I go across the railroad tracks out of town and up a little hill. And there on the top of a little knoll is a little church that wouldn't seat a hundred. Prettiest little thing, little steeple on it and a little porch on it and a little white steps. It was pretty. Right beside it was a little house. It looked like a dollhouse. It was a little three room situation for a man and his wife, the pastors. It was a park. There was no church around it. I mean, there were no buildings around it, no houses around it. There it sat. So I go walking up to the door and I knocked on the door. A great big guy that stood that much taller than me came to the door. And you know, pastors have a very important voice. He opened the door and he said, yes. It would knock a timid guy, cut off the porch. You know, the way he'd say, I said, sir, uh, you don't know me. He said, yes, I do. I said, I told you, you don't know me. I am Lester Sumrall from America. Yes, I know you, sir. Come on. I said, you don't know me. He said, yes, I do. Come on in. I said, my God, you got Howard Carter in this country, hadn't you? He said, yes. And I said, that man knew when I was coming, and now he knew where I am now, and I've got to live with him. It'll be like living in a glass cage to live with that man. He knew too much without seeing it with the eye, the gifts of the Spirit functioning. He handed me the little card. I got back on the boat and went into Australia. And there I preached around in, in several churches and just for a short time. Then I went into Brisbane and raised up a new church, rented a tent and raised up a new church. Today, that church has about a thousand members in it. One of the finest churches in Queensland and maybe in the whole of Australia. In three months of my time, we founded a church that continues to live because of the grace of God. It, it, it lives. In my first... Uh, and my first meeting in Australia, it was, in, it was in, uh, in Mr. Greenwood's church in Melbourne. He had about a thousand people. And so I was evangelist for a week. When the week was over, he didn't give me any offering. He told me, he said, uh, it is very interesting to be a young American, very rich and going around the world. I said, yeah. But what I didn't tell you that's so important is this. When I left America, all the money I had in the world was $12. But you know, I didn't even think about it. I, I can tell you honestly that I didn't get out to sea and start counting my $12. I didn't bother about it at all. Faith sometime, I don't think Abraham bothered about his faith. I think other people knew more about his faith than he knew about it. It was so, it was so natural, the thing he did, that he didn't, he didn't think God had to call it faith. So I left America with only $12. Had no denomination. I didn't ask them for a thing. I didn't tell anybody I was going. Had no churches. None of my family sent me any money. I left America. Was gone for two and a half years on this great evangelistic thrust. And I was, uh, uh, I had, I started with no money. And here in my first meeting in a big church, I got no money. <laughs> it was almost like leaving in San Francisco. When I, uh, my last two or three days in San Francisco, I preached for Dr. Haig, uh, Craig, uh, there in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the big temple, Glad Tidings Temple. And at that time, it was a very big auditorium and a very large audience. And uh, I preached for him for three nights, went out with his young people. He had a Bible school there, owned the street preaching. And, and he never gave me any money for my preaching. Uh, he, he just didn't do it. And on our way to the boat, he did take me to the boat when I left. He said, it must be nice to be a rich young man. I said, yeah, I think that would be nice. 
I didn't know he was talking about me. But, uh, but in those days, you see, I lived so far out in the country, I really didn't know people were supposed to give you money, you know? And, and so it, it didn't really bother me that he didn't give me any money for preaching. And I think in those days, maybe a lot of people preached in churches. Now today, anywhere you preach, they think they're supposed to give you money. Uh, but years ago, I don't think they felt like that, that you, you spoke because you were present, and I happened to be present. He did give me a place to stay and let me eat with the students. And, and so I, you know, I got my, my board free and it, maybe he thought that was enough. Uh, but uh, he wanted to quiz me. He said, who's going to pay your money? Who's going to buy your tickets and all? And I just kept saying, Jesus, Jesus. And he got angry at me. Uh, he was a man at that time, about 70 years of age. And uh, he, he, he got angry at me. And, and he blurted out, he says, you'll go to China and starve to death. And, and you know, besides being a Christian, I'm an Irishman. And I laughed and I said, well, if I do, Dr. Craig, uh, would you send a little stone out there about this big thing? Here lies Lester of Summerall, starved to death, trusting Jesus. Oh, he said, no. I said, you won't have to. Goodbye. Now, that's the way I left America. You know, a lot of things I've done didn't, weren't just nice. You know, that was not a sweet way to leave your country, but that was the last way I said goodbye, and that was the way I left America. And now we went to Australia in the first place. I preached, didn't give me any money, and I had no way to get to my next place. You see, I had no money to get to my next place. And so uh, when I went home on Sunday night, end of my meeting, I was staying in one of the members' homes. I said, buddy, uh, I don't have no way to leave town and go. I had a meeting the next night, a couple hundred miles away, and, and I had no way to get there, no way at all to get there. I said, now, Lord, I got news for you, and you want to hear me. I am never leaving this room till I have a ticket. I'm not going to get on the sidewalk with a big suitcase and no ticket. I'm not going to get on a train station and stand there like a fool waiting for a ticket. I said, you'll have to bring the ticket to this room or I will die in this room. And then my spirit broke and I lay down on the floor and cried all night because I had no way to get out of town and I was 12,000 miles away from home. Next morning, the, the uh, Australians that I was staying with Australians are good eaters. They fix beautiful food, delicious food. The, the little wife knocked on the door and said, uh, Brother Sumrall, breakfast is ready. I says, I'm not eating. Thank you very much. Go ahead without me. And I stayed in there in my room. Two or three things I did do. I packed my case. I put it by the door. I put my briefcase in my Bible by the door. Everything I had was by the door. I didn't, I didn't need two minutes to walk out, except I had no ticket. So I stayed in the room. Uh, they had breakfast around seven o'clock and he went off to work and she was busying around the house and at eight o'clock she came back to the door and knocked on the door and says, Brother Sumrall, are you there? And I said, yes, I'm here. So there's a man to see you from the church. So would you see him? And I said, yes. And a man came in, a big, fine looking Australian and he was crying. Well, I said, no, no, those pitiful tales, you know. Preachers get caught in so many of it. <laughs> and I was 20 years old now, you know, and I was getting, used to getting caught in them. And so he, uh, he said, I couldn't sleep last night. I said, well, I couldn't either. So what of it? Well, he said, now, if, if this isn't right, I won't ever try it again. I said, what you talking about? I had no idea. He said, now, I know you're rich. I said, yes. Why deny it? If everybody thinks you're rich, no need of denying it. Just let them talk about it. I said, yes. Now, he said, you're to preach. And he named the town. I said, yes. He said, tonight. I said, yes. He says, did you realize that that train that goes over there is a special and that it is a reserved train and nobody rides it without a special reservation. Do you have a reservation? I said, sir, I didn't even know it was a reserved train. He said, God told me that. I said, he did. Yeah. He said, God also told me to go get that reservation for you and that I should be the one honored to purchase the ticket for you. He says, I know you don't need it. And I know you've got plenty of money. <laughs> Amazing how rumors go. Here I was in a foreign country. Uh, but he said, God told me to. He said, no, you don't have a reservation. I said, no. He, says, I, he said, do you have a ticket? And I said, no. He said, here they are. And he had them in his hand, two tickets. One was a reservation for the reserve train. The other was a ticket to the city. He said, let's go. I put the tickets in my pocket. He took the case. I took the briefcase. And away we went. And I told him on the way. I said, sir, I received no money for preaching at your place for a week. And sir, I had no money to buy that ticket. It was God that told you about that. Ha! Oh, you talk about an Australian being a happy man. That man 
almost danced in the street. To think that God would speak to him at night and tell him about an American that he hardly knew. He'd only seen him up in the pulpit and he was sitting back in the yard. He had never shaken my hand before. And to tell him to go and to get me a reservation and to go and to get me a ticket and to bring it to me and then take me to the railway station and say, bye-bye. I'll meet him in heaven. And we'll both laugh and laugh about the miracles of God and the people who have the guts to trust the Almighty God who is able to do all things abundantly more than you're able to even conceive or think He's real. I have known Him to be real. Now you can look backwards. You can see the second great thing coming to pass. It was, it was a great vision. I saw the world. It was not functioning. We left a church. And that, raising up that church was interesting. Remember, I'd come out of the Deep South. I went into Australia where they hadn't had American evangelists before. They couldn't understand me. I couldn't understand them. One woman declared it took her a week before she could ever know my line of thought that I was preaching about. She said, I was determined to know what you're talking about. I came every night till I could understand you. That's a Yankee or, or a Southerner teaching people another language in Australia. Well, we were right across the street from a pub. A pub is a, is a tavern. And a lot of Australians, like English people, they go in there and get drunk. And my, my little tent was across the street. Two drunks came in. And I had a couple of ushers. I said, would you throw the drunks out, please? They're calling me bad names. You know what those Australians said? They're not hurting you. I said, they're disturbing the meeting. They said, just you. They're not disturbing the rest of us. So I tried to preach, and they'd laugh at me, being an American, and, and call me bad names. And they were drunk. Finally, I said, well, if you're not going to help me, sing a chorus. And while the audience sung a chorus, there wouldn't be over 200 of them. I walked to the back of the tent. I grabbed one of those drunks. I turned him around. I took him by his collar, and I took my foot, and I kicked him in the seat of his pants. I whammed him once, and I whammed him again. And I led him to the tent, and I whammed him, and when I did, his feet went out from under him, and the other drunk helped him up, and they both ran, saying, you better leave that American alone. Well, I came back in. I didn't know whether I was a preacher or not. You know, I told you I was Irish. I came back in, and those Australians stood to their feet and clapped for five minutes. And the next night, we had twice as many people as we had the first night. It, Australians and English people are very interesting. You know, they love to see a man take care of himself. And if you haven't been hurt, if somebody just spit on you, they say, oh, that didn't hurt you. If a man cusses you, they say, that don't bother you. And so they're not going to do anything about it. But if you take care of it yourself, they, they love you for it. They love you for it. And, and, and so we left behind us a church that today has a thousand members in it and is a very beautiful and fine church in Australia. We had very happy remembrances of Australia. Reverend Carter and I, he started a new Bible school that continues until this day. So while he was busy in one place, I was busy in another. So they got a new Bible school and a new church out of our visit there to their country. We got on a boat that was built for Kaiser Wilhelm. It was so gorgeous. It was too beautiful for tourists to be on. I've never been on such a magnificent thing in my life. Uh, it, was, uh, it was Kaiser Wilhelm's pleasure boat. The English people took it over after the war, World War I, and they were using it from Australia to Java, back and forth. And we rode this magnificent boat. It was one of the nicest things, and it was a time when Reverend Howard Card of London and I became acquainted. We, we were together for about two weeks on that boat, and we got acquainted. And I began to love an Englishman, and he began to love an American. He became my, my spiritual father. In fact, uh, he is the only man that truly, I suppose, ever loved me. Yeah, I, I suppose. I can't ever remember my father ever one time saying, son, I love you. He, he was hard. He loved me. Sure he did. Fed me. But, but he, he was a man of very few words, unless they were cuss words. And, and Howard Carter, I could preach the poorest sermon. And, and he'd say, you know, uh, he would call me Mr. Sumrall. He said, you know, Mr. Sumrall, that's a very fine sermon. He said, I can give you a few little pointers if you like, so the next time you give it. He was really, it was nothing, you know. He, he was a theologian and, and came from a very wealthy, rich background in England. His father was a famous inventor, and he was an inventor too before he went into the ministry. And he tutored me personally. I had the finest tutoring on the face of the earth from one of the wisest men I've ever known. And how beautiful it was. 
because he loved me. He loved me because I was a boy. He, he, he loved me because I could laugh. And, and now he was 41 and two, and I was 21 and two. And, and, and so we, we just fell in together. And I was an inspiration to him, and he was a teacher. And he was so good to me. If I needed a shirt, if I, he'd get it. I wouldn't have time to buy it until I couldn't let him know what I needed because he'd come bringing it in. He was so good to me. And uh, he also was moving by faith. He had no guaranteed a stipend of any kind, and he was living by faith, but he didn't tell you about it. Uh, it was all between him and God. We got to, to Java, uh, Indonesia, and there I went into training with God. Uh, we had so many invitations, we were only going to be there for three months. You know, we had to limit ourselves that we'd be gone all of our lives. Uh, and we were going to travel throughout the whole island of Java. So almost every night, he'd speak in one place and I'd speak in another, but we'd sleep in the same room. And so we had contact uh, where we slept and our meals were all together, but our preaching would be in two different places in order to cover more territory. And that happened very, very often. And after I'd been there for about uh, uh, 10 days, I was preaching to a large congregation, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe 1,500 people. And uh, on the front seat, on the front pew of this, it was a beautiful church. It was a new building. Uh, on, the, on the front pew, uh, a little girl, looked like 11 or 12, came off and went on the floor and, and began to act like a snake and stick her tongue out like a snake. And eyes, crazy, wild, I mean really wild, frightening. And she'd go up and down. Now, the, the, strain that were, the thing that got me was nobody noticed it but me. The people standing by just kept singing the songs. And they didn't even look down. And I was, <laughs> after all, I'd never seen it before, never in my life. And, and the, the pulpit didn't notice it. They led the song service. They had their prayers. They read their Bible. And they had their whole show, and nobody looked down. And I said, oh, God, when are they going to stop that girl going like a snake up and down? And, and uh, foaming, she had some green stuff that came out of her mouth this far, you know. Oh, it was, it was, it was messy. You better believe it. It was messy. And, and so uh, I said, when are they going to stop that girl? When are they going to do something? <laughs> and nobody did. Had church for 45 minutes. And I said, Lord, save souls, save souls. The Lord said, you have to take care of this down here first. I said, Lord, you take care of it. God said, no, that is your problem. Ooh, I said, my problem. Huh, that's a new problem. I'd never seen anything like it. I'd never heard a sermon in my life on demon possession. Never. Not. I'd never read a book on the subject. I mean, talk about being illiterate. I knew nothing about it. So I got up from a to chair. I was sitting away in the back of the platform. And my interpreter was here by me. And so I got up and I went walking toward the pulpit. <laughs> and he walked on the other side to the pulpit. And rather than saying, good evening, friends, I'm glad to be in Java. It is a beautiful island. You're such beautiful, you know, all that stuff you hear from visitors. Uh, I, I, I didn't say that. I leaned over and I pointed down toward that little girl. I said, you get up from there and sit on that seat right now. Well, I didn't mean to say that. I didn't know I was going to say that. I just said it. And, and the interpreter got so startled, he didn't say a word. Now, the girl understood no English. I understood no Javanese. But the devil understood. That girl took her hand and she wiped that green mess off of her face and neck and head and backed up to that pew and she sat down like a zombie. She sat there and... and uh, uh, she didn't move, not a muscle, just like a statue. For 45 minutes while I preached, she just sat there. And I thought it was all over, excepting when I got through preaching, I leaned over and I said, now come out of her. And as if you had seen a dog become a human, that little thing changed. She came out of that stupor. Her eyes became cleansed, pretty little girl eyes. She was so sweet. She looked around, and I said, what is she saying? Oh, she said to the one by her, where am I? She was so full of the devil, she didn't know where she was. When she became free of demon power by the voice of an evangelist speaking the word of God to her, when she became free, hundreds of people come running down the aisles to be set free, to be delivered, and to be saved. I didn't have to ask them to. When they saw she was set free, they came. Well, we closed the meeting, and I went on back to my room, and I was sad. It would have been a kind of a nasty thing, you know? A surgeon is different from a chiropractor. He just kind of boom, 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 
bumps you around a little bit and sends you home. But Brother Surgeon doesn't. He gets out his knife and he starts cutting things open. He's different. And I became a spiritual surgeon. And no, no, no chiropractic work. I was a surgeon. And I told Mr. Carter, I said, now you are a very elegant person and a very well-trained person and a highly educated person. I said, I don't think you want to travel with me anymore. He said, why? And I told him the story like I told you. And I said, it was pretty nasty. I said, I screamed. And I don't know why I screamed. But I said, the girl was set free and a few hundred people got saved. Well, <laughs> you have to know English and uh, appreciate that. Well, sounds all right to me. I said, does it really? Yeah. Well, I said, I hope it never happens again. I hope that disease only has one person down and I'm finished with that one. Hope it's all over. Well, we'll see. <laughs> so I said, well, we'll keep traveling together. I never expected to find another mess like that in the world. No, I thought it was all over. But you know, it wasn't but another week in another city. I was only there in this church one night. The place was packed and jammed with hundreds of people. They had even put chairs down, down through the aisles. And as I walked in with my interpreter, I hope there'll be some interpreters in heaven. There might be. I don't know. They've sure messed up a lot of things. And I walked in and, and he walked in front of me. Of course, the aisle was narrow because of the extra chairs. One third of the way down, a woman caught me by my coat and I wouldn't let go. She got a, I didn't know what to slap her face or what, you know. After all, this is a primitive part of the world, just kaboot her one. And I said, well, that wouldn't look right for the preacher to start hitting people. And, and, and she wouldn't let me go. That interpreter walked right on and got on the platform and began to say, well, how could I go when somebody had a hold of me? Well, I could have done like Joseph. I could have just given him a coat, but I needed it. So I didn't want to give it to her. So finally, I dropped my briefcase with my Bible in it and I leaned over. And when I did, she spoke in English and said, there's a little uh, black angel in you and there is a little white angel in me. And then her eyes looked like about 40 serpents in each one of them glaring at me with a, with a strange kind of a grin. Whew. I brought this arm up that she had a hold of and I took the other one and I clamped them on both sides of her head and you could hear me all over that church and out in the yard. I said, you're a liar. I said, I have Jesus in me. He's white. He's clean. He's pure. You have the devil in you with the blackness of hell. I said, come out of her. Now, I hadn't been taught to do things like that. Neighbor, you would have given a thousand dollar bill to have been there. Her eyes changed. Her face changed. Joy came to her. She released me. And I said, how long you been like that? She said, for 15 years when I went to the witch doctor, I got all messed up like this. And says, I've been messed up with demons ever since. I said, come out of there, every one of you, and be free. And free she became. The glory of God hit that whole audience. Now, we walked in there, they were singing. When I began to scream, they all stopped singing. And here I was, two-thirds of the way back out toward the yard. So by myself, without my interpreter, who was supposed to be my guide and, and you know, my valet and everything else, that's what he's supposed to be, I went off there by myself. But the glory of God had hit that place already. I stood right up and spoke, and hundreds of people got saved. Well, I went back to the room where I was staying with Mr. Howard Carter of London, England. I said, now, Brother Carter, I, 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 I really think this time that when you hear this story, you won't ever want to travel with me anymore. I said, now this one didn't take place at the pulpit. I, I, I said, at the pulpit, I just spoke. But I said, this time I grabbed that woman and I, I, I come in it. Well, he said, that sounds all right to me. Well, I said, it's not in the Bible. And I, I said, I don't want to be doing what's wrong. He said, it sounds good to me. He says, well, anytime anybody's set free, that's good. And, and I said, well, I, I just wish it wouldn't happen anymore. I said, I'd like to be a preacher like you are, you know, with dignity and, and, and um, with, with brilliance and, and you know, a well-educated. I said, I, I'd like to be a preacher like you. And he said, well, you, you'll be, that, that's all right. But says, this other's very necessary. He, he said, when it happens, let it go. Isn't it good that I had a, a trustworthy person 
and a man twice my age, a man that had already ministered around the world, a man that was a Bible college president. And wasn't it nice to have a man like that uh, to assure me and to teach me as we would read the Bible together and he'd show me the things in there regarding delivering people from the power of the devil. This happened many times in the Orient and it happened again in Europe and happened again in America. In part three of Lester Sumrall, A Man of Faith and Destiny, I'll tell you a few more of these deliverances. We had tremendous revivals together. Mr. Carter laid hands upon thousands of people who received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I laid my hands upon thousands of people that were instantly healed by God's power and gave their hearts to Jesus and were saved. We made a, a remarkable team. It was like a Paul and a Timothy uh, together, uh, an older one and a younger one, moving in strength and vigor uh, throughout the world. This went on for years and years and years, right up into World War number two. It, it continued. And I didn't stop there, and he didn't stop there. And after the war, our friendship continued, just like this story will continue. Lord, bless my friend. And right now, let Jesus come into the heart of those that do not know you. If you don't know the Lord, ask forgiveness of your sin right now. Won't you do it? He'll come into your heart. If you would like to have a copy of this, you can receive it in audio, just like I have here, the whole hour. It's called part two. Or you can receive it in video, one hour also, in beautiful, magnificent color. And so I hope that you will order these. Show them to others how God took a boy from away down south, brought him up through the pine trees into the north and across to the west coast and around the world to preach the living truths of the Word of God. God is a miracle working God and God is doing great and mighty things on the face of this earth. He would like for you to be part of what he's doing. Write to me, Lester Sumrall, South Bend, Indiana, zip code 46624, USA. We'd be delighted to hear from you. We love you. God loves you. We know his power. His power is real. His power is for today. Let his power come into your life and your home and in your church. You'll always be glad for the mighty power of God, sovereign in its operation and magnificent in its glory. We want you to be part of it. And until we meet you back again, we pray that God will bless you, that you will smile with happiness and hold your shoulders high in victory. And remember every day, when you feed your faith, you starve your doubts to death. So every day, feed your faith, and let your doubts die.